Uh, I want to do a show of hands as well. So in this room, uh, who here thinks that we are in the beginning of an intelligence explosion? Okay, that's, I think that's slightly more than half the room. Uh, let me ask it the other way. Who here doesn't think that we're in the beginning of an intelligence explosion? Okay, almost, I, I saw one person raise their hand. So only one person is, is willing to say, not, not, intelligence explosion not happening. Um, so if you raise your hand and, and, and you think that uh, we're in an intelligence explosion and you're into crypto, then this talk is for you. Because maybe uh, you haven't fully, real, fully internalized what it actually means uh, for yourself, for your job, for your coins, for your kids, for your spouse, for your family. Every person you love, every person you know, and your very existence on this planet. Because even if you get that we're in an intelligence explosion, playing that version of reality out and adjusting for it is not an easy task. And there's a big difference between intellectually understanding something and emotionally being prepared to act on that belief. Um, it's kind of like a chimpanzee that sees a human and realizes that that human is, 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 is very smart, but it's very hard for the chimpanzee to sort of imagine that that human is now going to fly spaceships, go to the moon, uh, create nuclear weapons, and eliminate forests, and change the ecosystem. So regardless if the chimpanzee understands that the human is very smart, and he's here now, how is this chimpanzee supposed to plan for that? So we're going we're gonna to play out some some intelligence explosion scenarios today. OK, so let me start with what's the premise here? Like when we're talking about an intelligence explosion, what is actually the premise? So um, the premise that we're working under is that there is intelligence in text, in words, and how those words are connected to each other. OK? So what I have here is a, this is a dish rag. Imagine that it's filled with the collective intelligence in all written human, human text. And it's filled with this kind of water. And so somehow, with deep learning and the transformer architecture, we're able to squeeze out and mimic that intelligence that exists inside that dish rag. So you can imagine that all the written data in the world is like a this rag, and, and, and what deep learning is able to do is squeeze the intelligence out of it. And the reason, the reason that this works at all, uh, on a basic level, and we've known this since the 80s, the late 80s, uh, well, not we, a, a couple of people has known this since the late 80s and the early 90s, that uh, there's this foundational theory called the, universe, uh, the universal approximation theorem, uh, which describes that a neural net given enough layers and the right weights can approximate any mathematical function. So when you hear that AI is all that it is, an AI model, all that it is, is a file with different probabilities and words, remember that that is enough, at least in theory, to approach any cognitive abilities that can be codified and embed any underlying world model. So the theory, there is solid mathematical theory for this. We're not just you know, making stuff up. I'm sorry, I realize now that I have the same chart that Brian Johnson just showed you. Um, what I want to talk about here is how much intelligence can we actually squeeze out from text? So we probably cannot squeeze out more intelligence from text uh, than what is in very well-written, smart human literature. It, the old adage of garbage in, garbage out probably still holds true, even if you have, you know, the largest neural net trained on a billion dollar AI cluster, if it's all, if the training data is filled with zeros, that's not going to create a smart model. So how smart can that data get? Well, so let's start with the premise that if you go to, if you are able to squeeze out the intelligence from the smartest books, how smart these models could get is at the level of a very, very smart human. And we have some, some evidence that, that um, supports this, that um, if you, we have some evidence that if you simply throw more compute at the problem of trying to train a better model, there's a limit 
uh, where simply spending more computational resources in training does not, minimize, uh, does not further minimize validation loss. Um, but, uh, and this is important, the premise isn't that we're just going to throw more GPUs at this and train LLMs and we'll reach super intelligence. The premise is that we'll, we'll be able to train neural nets to at least get somewhat close to being as smart as really, really smart humans. And that's when they'll be able to start to recursively self-improve by doing the research to figure out how to further unhobble itself, how to algorithmically improve its efficiency, and explore other architectural changes, uh, like using slow and fast weights, for example. Uh, the end goal basically being what, what Alpha Zero did for chess, being able to play against itself until it had enough synthetic data to beat any other computer, any other, uh, other human in, in chess. Uh, but we don't need to build that. We just need to build an AI that is able to, self, uh, to recursively self-improve itself. And, and we're seeing some of that stuff um, happening today. So, we, so I, I guess some of you people have maybe tried uh, the latest model uh, 01 preview from OpenAI. Uh, so they're able to improve the capability of the model simply by allowing GPT-4 to think longer. This is called a variable inference time. So it's, it, it does inference for varying lengths. And the plan is to use the, the chain of thought outputs, given that they can be graded for reinforcement learning, as synthetic data to the next model. So just to be clear, the O1 uh, preview model is not a new base model. It's not GPT-5. But the data that's generated from that in those trail of thoughts that it produces can be used to drain something more powerful than GPT-4. So we're already seeing some of this sort of recursive self-improvement effects, although human engineers are still uh, had, uh, in, in charge of that. So let's talk about what this means for crypto. Uh, because most of us, like I see you, we're running around doing the same stuff. We're investing in the same kind of Crypto companies were thinking the same way, but the world is not anymore the way it used to be. So let's talk about what's going to happen if we're actually in an intelligence explosion, which most of you seem to think that we are. So there's going to be a fight for attention. They're making super intelligence. We're making ass points. Okay? So that leads to competition for capital. There's going to be a fight for capital. And Sandeep, I love you, but what I, the, the announcement of, of, of Sentient, I have no idea, idea what you guys were talking about, but we're seeing like $85 million uh, seed rounds in AI, uh, and that is becoming sort of less common in, in crypto. So we're seeing increased, the hot ball of money that you talk about is used to be in crypto, it's starting to shift to be more in AI. Because again, we're making ass coins, they're making super talented. So it's not weird that this is happening. And when you think about it, like if you're a VC and you invest in a crypto project, usually you have a three-year time span until you get liquidity on that investment. So traditionally, you give a team some dollars to go work on some crypto infra for three years, parallelized EVM, intense-based systems. And then look, there's an intelligence explosion. Maybe now the machines are better at writing parallelized EVMs than, than we are. So you basically have no idea what the world looks like on the other side of that investment. And so the whole VC playbook that we're sort of trudging along with, does it even work anymore? So what happens? What happens now? Do we all just simply flee crypto? Like there's nothing here. And so I would be completely comfortable, happy to say, if it was the case that I believe that crypto has no relevance in this future of an AGI, uh, 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 an intelligence explosion. But I've, I've thought about it for many months, and this is the best I'm coming up with. And I think what I'm going to show here is that there is a role for crypto to play in this environment. And I did not, uh, the, the twirling animation here, that's, that's not intentional. It was the only animation that, for some reason, Keynote allowed me to do. So if there's, a, if there's an intelligence explosion, that will lead to a global AGI arms race. It'll be the most powerful technology that a nation state can use against other countries to, 
do cyber warfare on each other, to build, to control armies against each other, there will, there will be an AGI arms race. And if there's an AGI arms race, well, what does, what, what does that mean? So in, during World War II, the United Kingdom and Japan borrowed over 100% of their GDP. The United States borrowed 60% of their GDP, which would be $17 trillion today. And the same thing with World War I. Uh, United Kingdom, France, Germany, all of them borrowed 100% of their, their GDP. So we would have massive fiat, uh, fiat printing if we went into an AGI arms race. Um, but also have geopolitical turmoil. Like we would start to compete for these resources that, for example, you know, China is next to Taiwan. Taiwan has TSMC. TSMC makes the chips that goes into uh, NVIDIA that, create, that, that creates the chips that allows us to train to, uh, int more intelligence models. Um, so there's, it's unlikely to see how the world would be stable in an environment where all these different nations are competing for the control over AGI. And then trade becomes more difficult because <clears throat> The currencies that we're using, they're inflating. Tur the geopolitics is more um, you know, infected and convoluted than it's ever been before. And so how are we gonna do commerce when sort of the trust between countries are broken, when everyone is sort of in a cold war between each other? Can we use, if we can't use fiat currencies, we don't trust each other's fiat currencies, well, can we use oil? Can we, use, can we use gold? Well, not if that gold is in a specific vault in a specific country. So maybe, uh, maybe Bitcoin becomes the only way that we can transact with in this kind of world. Maybe Bitcoin is the only neutral, um, non-physical instrument of money that we can use. So then, uh, if that's the case, then we really got to fix Bitcoin. We, get, we, we really got to fix lightning and the scaling issues. We don't have more time. So if you know what OpCAD is, it's an upgrade to Bitcoin. This is something that if, if you want Bitcoin to be able to sort of be a part in this AGI arms race and act as a currency, then, then support OpCAD, but that's a different discussion. Um, but we should also think about, so, okay, so how will Bitcoin mining compete if there are AI superclusters that dominate the energy grids? Let's say an AGI arms race, your average AI supercluster is connected to the la largest energy arteries on Earth, uh, as they would be if it's a matter of like absolute national security. And let's say that these, on, on average, these superclusters uh, are connected to power sources that consume 100 times the capacity of all the Bitcoin mining farms in the world. Would this pose a threat to the Bitcoin network that is only consuming a small fraction of the, of the electricity, and there's data centers that has access to 100 times that? Well, you may say no, but then let's talk about the, uh, the ASIC chip farms. So let's say that you're not worried about the energy asymmetry, and, but how about then if you consider the fact that today, $500 drones are destroying $5 million tanks in Ukraine? So let me add in some drone swarms here in this picture. Um, so in a world where Bitcoin becomes the main instrument for trade during the AGI arms race, are you sleeping fine knowing that our ASIC chip farms are centralized in single locations and can basically be, be destroyed by, say, a, a swarm of drones where each drone costs 500 bucks? So this leads you into an interesting conversation. So, so maybe proof of stake based coins fare better. I think someone at this conference has to come up with a with a, a bull thesis for Ethereum. If you guys have seen the the ETH BTC chart, chart lately, um, so this is kind of a dream scenario for shitcoiners, right? For the shitcoiners in the room, uh, a lot of a lot of shitcoins are based on proof of stake. So maybe you guys still have a chance, uh, except for the fact that you know if if drones, you know, this would only be the case if if drone swarms are. At, all over the place, and the world is basically in disarray and in chaos at that point. But at least your proof of stake coins might have some utility. Um, now, so this is perhaps what people want to know about the most. Isn't crypto and AI a marriage made in heaven? What if we can subdue superintelligence using decentralization so that no evil government, no centralized entities 
would wield the keys to this power. No, uh, so given that we don't have uh, a way to efficiently verify AI computation, you can't use the centralized mechanisms to, inf to incentivize uh, inference or training. And even if we could, uh, the global grassroots community is not going to be able to amass the kinds of AI H100 chips necessary to be a serious rival in the AGI arms race, especially not in a global arms race where the supply chains for uh, chip manufacturing is heavily controlled. But uh, AI will need will need crypto for that sweet, sweet, fast, fast exit liquidity. Because if you think about it, if you are uh, a person who's building an AI company, how are you going to give your investors an exit path on that liquidity if the whole world basically is, you know, changes in three years? So how, how, how are you going to invest in an AI project if the, you know, the traditional capital formation process doesn't work if the whole world changes in three years? So how are you going to get liquidity on your AI investment? Well, basically, AI projects will have to marry crypto coins so that they can get access to the liquidity that they need. Um, I'll make one caveat to that, and, um, that's, uh, and this is, uh, I won't have time to, to, to fully explain this, but um, there is a concept called futarchy, and it's a forward-looking way for companies and nations to self-regulate using prediction markets and by policing themselves uh, in favor of outcomes that would be the most profitable. So one thing that we have been successful at building in crypto are prediction markets. Prediction markets is, the, is a cornerstone to futarchy, and stable coins are a cornerstone to prediction markets. So if you wanted to do something in the crypto AI field, don't go the, don't try to like decentralize and win the AGI arms race. You're not going to be successful at doing that. But you can leverage the powerful incentivization mechanisms that we have in crypto, the prediction markets, to allow and inform, uh, for example, open AI, to give them more data points on how powerful is their next model going to be and allow people to bet on that and create the financial incentives for people to self-regulate. So this is a bigger topic. We're going to go into something a little bit more simple if this is like way out of your head. So one thing that you can do um, is you can buy a bunker. So bunkers are maybe the most underpriced real estate in the world right now. You can buy a 60s, 70s military bunker. Um, for a fraction, I'm talking single digit percent of what their production cost is. So when, if, if people start buying up bunkers, um, and you can buy one now for let's say $800,000 and the production cost is 20 million, well, you know, that's kind of an underpriced asset. And at least then you know you'll be able to keep your employees safe from drone, drone swarms so that you can keep your crypto projects going. That's, uh, that's actually, that's, uh, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Eric Wall, by the way. I'm ERCWL on Twitter. Thank you, guys.